know that uh, our life is in your hand. We ask you to help us to uh, treasure the gifts of life, to bring life to those around us, uh, and help us to uh, live our lives so that one day we may be united with you in heaven, be with you and our loved ones. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Well, uh, in case you don't know me yet, uh, I'm a father to one fall. Uh, I'm a parochial vicar here. Um, I've been ordained uh, 15 years now, and I've done uh, so many funerals that I don't remember <laughs> how many funerals I've done. Uh, but uh, uh, this month is the, no, the, uh, the month of November. We pray for the soul, so I think you know, it's probably maybe a good um, opportunity to talk about. Um, uh, Death about what the, the church, what do uh, Catholics say about uh, death? Come on, you folks. Let me see. Let me see if we can figure out some chairs yeah. there for you. No, no, well, more okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, but what I'm going to sit down and you can you. Can you you know, here's a chair back. Well, no, I'll sit back there. You want to sit here? Oh, we have to use a musical chair. Sorry. Yeah, oh, sorry. Sorry about that. We have to bring more chair up here, too. There's a chair right here. There's two chairs I would like to stand, actually. Yeah, he needs it. Maybe what's one show there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, but I'm the front row. And we so could also, we could also turn around that uh, couch. Oh. The turn it around the couch if you need to. Anyway, just sit down. This, no, no, this he needs me to stand. Okay. Anyway. Yeah. 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 See, divide providence. We have uh, enough chair and just exact number of chairs for everybody. <laughs> we talk about divine problems today too, so that's good. Um, so anyway, I've been there in 15 years, and uh, um, uh, one of the questions uh, that uh, sometimes people ask me is, uh, do you believe in ghosts? Oh, by the way, this picture is from uh, an old uh, catechism, French catechism. The upper part is show the death of the righteous. So uh, the righteous, the righteous man when he dies, um, he has the priest right there. He embraces the cross. You have uh, Jesus and Mary waiting for him. You have the family surround him, the angel uh, comforting him. So that's the death of a righteous man. And then below you have the death of the unrepentant sinner. And uh, so the unrepentant sinner turned away from the priest, turned away from the cross. Uh, he turned toward, uh, I think there's a money bag, or oh, like, so there's a money bag there, but uh, typically what you see is a, a money bag or a picture of a, a beautiful woman. But basically he turned toward uh, the devil and uh, away from Jesus, the angel, uh, the angels, uh, uh, turn away, uh, crying, uh, weeping for the loss uh, of, uh, of that man, right? So, uh, now that you don't see this kind of uh, depiction anymore in the church, but this is taken from uh, the Catechism uh, of the French. Alright, question is, um, do you believe in ghosts? And, and to answer this question, um, it is important for us to, uh, 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 to clarify what we mean by ghosts? Uh, do you uh, do we consider uh, saints as ghosts? Uh, in a way, yes, they are beings living in another world, in the spiritual world, and they do interact with our world. Saints are all those who are in heaven. Saint is just another name for a uh, holy one. So that if someone, someone dies and goes to heaven, then he or she is a holy person or a saint. By the way, St. Paul called uh, Christians living still, still living as saints. In, um, for example, in the letter to the Philippians, he said, Paul and Timothy, uh, uh, Timothy, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at the, Philipp uh, at the Philippi. At Philippi. So, Said, uh, Paul called living Christians as saints, uh, right? Um, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, the saints 
are able to appear to the living when they will. Okay. Oh, what happened here? Yeah. Um, Aquinas says, by the divine power, it is not unfitting for the souls of the saints to be endowed with a power in virtue of their glory, so that they are able to appear wondrously to the living when they will. So if your loved ones die and go to heaven, the question is, can they appear to you, or can you ask them for a sign? I would say yes. Uh, I, I told this before, but uh, uh, I was very close to my maternal uh, grandmother. Uh, she died in Vietnam when I was uh, nine years old. And um, back then, we didn't take her to the funeral home. We basically washed her body and then laid her at home in one of the rooms and covered her with the, a white uh, uh, bed sheet. Um, and I was very comfortable with her. I was there playing with her body, touching her ears, touching her hair, her hands. When she died, I was right there when she took her last breath and everything. And she was so close to me, I was very comfortable with her. Uh, at, at night, the family uh, uh, held a video. Basically, we, we gathered in the other room, uh, eating, talking, prayer, and her body is in uh, the other room. So my aunt said to me, um, uh, Lord, why don't you ask Grandma if, uh, if, if she went to heaven, then give us a sign. So I went into, into the room and I, I said, Grandma, Grandma, you know, <laughs> if you uh, went to heaven, um, give us a sign, okay? And then I, I walked out. On my way out, I, I, for some reason, I turned back. And I saw this glow, this glow from her body, from her body. And I jumped out of the room, I screamed. My mom and my aunt asked me, what happened? Why did you scream? And I, I didn't want to say anything. I, I was so scared, I couldn't tell them what happened. But that night, I was, I was so afraid. I did not want to go back in there. I did not want to go past that room unless somebody was with me. Even though before that, I was so comfortable. So I don't know. I don't know if you take that as a sign. But, um, you know, there is, uh, like St. Thomas said, uh, the saints are able to... Uh, communicate to appear to the living when they will. And then um, uh, the more apparent instances are the miracles performed by the canonized saints. Uh, for example, uh, Pope John Paul II, uh, he died in 2005. In 2011, a woman lived in Costa Rica named uh, uh, Floribeth Mora Diaz. She suffered a brain aneurysm. The doctor, her, the doctor told her that her conditions were terminal and that she would have only one month to live. As a wife and a mother of four children, she had a, a strong desire to live and, begin, and began praying to Pope John Paul II for his intercession. Uh, coincidentally, the beatification of John Paul II was scheduled to take place on May 1, 2011, and Floribeth decided to watch the events on TV. After watching the mass, the beatification, she went to sleep and was awakened by John Paul saying, get up, don't be afraid. So the Pope appeared to her in her, in her, in her sleep. Much to her husband's surprise, she got out of bed and told him that she felt well. She also informed him about her encounter with the deceased pontiff. And she um, sub sub subsequently underwent several medical tests, including new brain scans, which left her neurologists and other doctors wholly stupefied. They declared that her virtually uh, instantaneous cure was scientifically inexplicable by any known natural agency. Uh, Rome investigated this incident, declared that it was a miracle, and uh, it led to uh, Pope John Paul II canonization, canonization in uh, 2014. Okay, so that's an instant of uh, the living, the, uh, the saints appearing to us here yeah, in this world. 
How about we talk about the ones in heaven? How about the ones in purgatory? Those uh, who need help. Catholics uh, believe that there are souls in purgatory, but not souls wandering around outside of God's providence. God is the master of the universe, of both the living and the dead. Nothing is outside of his control. And so it is important for us to uh, stress that souls can only visit us with uh, permission from God. Okay. Oh, by the way, oh, let's do this. Ah, um, have you, uh, maybe, maybe you want to uh, answer this too. Um, have, you had any, have you had any experience outside from the dead? Uh, you can need one show your hands. You don't have to say anything. But any any of you have experience of uh, uh, of size from the dead? Anything like that? No, really? Okay. Maybe we'll talk about that. Maybe you can tell us a bit more later. Okay. But anyway, um, this prayer book is from a nun and is in in a small museum in Europe. I can't remember the exact country, but uh, uh, she said that uh, the soul visited her from purgatory and left uh, a a palm print on her. Uh, uh, prayer book, okay? Um, let me see, where, where am I? Um, many saints have uh, talked about being asked by souls from purgatory for their prayers. Uh, an example is Padre Pio. We'll, we'll, we'll go to this example in a few minutes. Um, we can pray and do good works for the souls in purgatory, of course, God can just allow us. God can just allow us to enter heaven without us asking it. But God, in His infinite wisdom, desires that we use what God has given us to do good works, so that in some little way we merit heaven. Our good work for the dead is an act of love or mercy, and that's the point. God wants us to act out our love and not just say it. Praying, which includes going to Mass, is a good work. Helping the poor is another example of good work. Let's say, for example, let's say a man, while he was alive, ran an uh, investment scheme where he took money from clients and squandered it so that many people lost their savings. Let's say that that man went to confession before he died. Well, we can assume that uh, his sin was forgiven. But what about all the damage he had done to other people? That's where purgatory makes sense. He may not have gone to heaven yet, but may have to spend time in purgatory. We, the living, can help him to go to heaven by repaying his financial debt. Priests can offer masses for the souls in purgatory because Catholics believe in the efficacy of the mass. The mass is a sacrifice Jesus offered for sinners so that when we celebrate a mass for a particular soul, we ask Jesus to show mercy to that uh, particular person. Okay? Um, Let's um, look at the example of uh, Padre Pio. Um, in 1922, uh, sorry guys, we ran out of seats, but uh, we'll <laughs> you can sit on the front somewhere. <laughs> Padre Pio, born in 1922, died in 1934. Uh, he died in 1934. A picture of him, a very rare picture of him, because usually what he does, he what he did, he he hid his wounds. He had the stigmata and Rome, uh, and many people flocked to see him. So Rome said, "You need to hide your wounds. The stigmata is the wounds on the on the on the hands, on the side, and on the feet. I think he had all five stigmata, and uh, Rome said, "You need to hide hide those wounds." Uh, because it becomes too much a a a, a, um, um, a fantastic event. It, it's too much. It costs too much. Uh, uh, the the uh, stir too much. The, the thing. The things done too many things up. 
So he, he usually would cover those wounds as probably they're painful too. I mean, they, they're probably painful. I mean, it's not, it's not something, you know, you, you do walk around showing people show off just to for fun. It also it causes him a lot of pain, it's inconvenience. And so usually he would, he would call them up, but you know, when, 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 when he, sometime when he did a blessing like that, then, then, then it, you can see uh, the wounds uh, on uh, his hands. So in 1922, uh, Padre Pio told a bishop and several friars about the story of a soul who uh, visited him from purgatory. On a snowy uh, window evening, Padre Pio was sitting by the fireplace in the fiery, in the convent, praying when an old man sat down beside him. Padre Pio could not imagine how, could, how he could have entered the fiery at, at this time of night. Who are you? What do you want? Padre asked. This man said his name was Pietro de Moro and that he had died in this fiery on September 18, 1908, when it was a poor house. He had fallen asleep with a lighted cigar, a, a, a lighted cigar which set the mattress on fire and he dies suffocated and burned. The old man said, I am still in purgatory. I need a holy mass in order to be freed. God permitted that I come and ask you for help. Padre Pio replied, best assure that tomorrow I will celebrate mass for your liberation. And then walked him to the door which had been closed and locked. Padre Pio offered mass for the old man as promised. A few days later, he went, to, uh, he went with another friar to the town hall and looked at records from 1908. There they found on September 18 in that year, a man named Pietro de Moro had indeed died of burns and asphyxiation in the place which at that time was a poor house and now was the fiery. So that's a very um, vivid example of this, uh, a soul from purgatory come back to ask for our help for intercession, right? Uh, this is almost another painting. You can see uh, the soul uh, in the underworld, in, in purgatory, reaching up to, reaching up for help, trying to get to heaven, asking for God's grace, asking for the bread of life of Jesus. Okay, okay. Uh, we talk about uh, the souls of the saints and those in purgatory, but what about evil souls or evil spirits? Uh, Catholics do believe that there are evil spirits in the world, in this world, but that's because God allows them to be in this world. Well, why does God allow such thing? Because that is how our free will is perfected. When we are given uh, the chance to choose between good and evil, that is when we exercise our free will, and that is how our free will is perfected. Even though there are evil spirits in the world, we need not be overly anxious about them. Uh, focus on God, live in the light, and evil can't harm you. We should avoid being involved with fortune tellers, seances, how you say seances, uh, mediums, witchy boy, and the like. Proper contact with the dead should only come from uh, divine providence. Um, so I'll give you a case. Um, I was ordained in 2008 and got sent to a parish, a Vietnamese parish in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, while I was there, there were three people came from, I think it was from South Carolina or something like that. They came to the church uh, very distressed and they said they, they were not Christians. Uh, they were not Christians. Um, and they wanted, to, they wanted to, uh, to have a successful business. They, pro they were probably struggling with their business. So what did they do? They went to see a medium and asked the medium to contact um, a soul, 
to help them with their business. <coughs> and uh, that's what the medium did. And they said, uh, from then on, there was a lot of disturbances in their house. Uh, there was uh, scratching, there was uh, unusual noises, a lot of bad things. And they could not sleep in their house, so they went to the hotel. <coughs> And and, uh, and and then and then eventually they traveled up north and went to our church and asked the priest there to, to help the pastor there. Uh, so we the pastor prayed over them and he when he put the rosary on them they they they, they struck God they didn't like that kind of thing. Uh, so what I'm saying to you is that um, you know we have to be careful when we uh, when we deal with spiritual matters because there are people who like to do that they like to contact the uh, the other world and the dead uh, <laughs> but um, we have to be careful because um, we may you may be entering into a dark world that you may be invoking the dark force and that's that's not going to be good for it. the problem with, with the, the thing with God is that a lot of time you and I we pray we pray we pray we pray and it doesn't seem like God answer our prayer. And so what do we do? We turn to <laughs> to somebody who's willing to give us our things, the thing that we want. Maybe the devil, but uh, we have to be careful because uh, the devil can really uh, cause harm to us, right? And so we, um, I'm going to end pretty soon in a few minutes and let uh, Diana talk. Um, also give uh, her, uh, her presentation. On uh, on life and death uh, and and and, and uh, uh, you know uh, just what do Catholics say about death? Uh, but the point of this presentation, Diana and I, is to um, you know because most of us, if not all of us, we we might have lost uh, loved ones, right? And so um, uh, it's important for us to. To, to, to remember that um, uh, we are, you are not alone. Uh, it can be very hard losing someone you love, but God is always with us, our loved ones, even if they have passed away, are with us. And then you also have the uh, a Christian community that Christ has founded to be with you. Um, the Christian community such as uh, the Blessed Sacrament Parish, the Blessed Sacrament Parish want to assure you that we are here to uh, support you. Um, and in time of darkness, it is important. It is important to remind yourself to have faith, hope, and love. Okay, very good. Um, so I think I'm going to turn it over to Diana now and. Uh, you probably uh, know her already. She's uh, the head of uh, the uh, our Dominican ladies, and uh, she's also very knowledgeable about theology. And so, so we'll pull up her file and have her uh, speak some more about the theology of. Uh, uh, yeah, just just search. Go ahead. Do we have the power to send the soul to hell? Do we have? To help the souls in hell? To help send them to hell. No, we don't. We don't do. Uh, we can't do that. That's that's the that's the only God can do. The only God can do that. You yeah. know, people sometimes they are so angry and they said, you know, oh, you know, they cursed somebody to hell, that kind of thing. Um, but you shouldn't. And number one, you shouldn't do that. Number two, <laughs> <laughs> you should do that. Number two, um, uh, only God can do that. But suddenly, be a good example. You know, you because you can really scandalize people. You can really do damage to people. And and and, and in that sense, you 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 may you may have some responsibility to people who are wounded because of you. You know, if. if if I go out there and I harm a little child, and that child grow up and become angry, become a criminal because of the abuse I've done to that child, but I should bear some responsibility to that too, right? So that's that's when that's when you have to be very careful with, with, with being, you know, we have we have to be good example to people because if we contribute to their petition, then God is going to hold us 
uh, accountable to that. So that on one hand, on the, on the other hand, uh, we make mistakes. You know, sometimes parents, I know parents, um, I know, I know a family not here, far, far away. Um, the dad was very strict to his children, and one day, one day the boy, a teenager, he took his own life, and that was devastated, absolutely devastated. From then on, he changed, changed very much. He became more gentle his, to his children, but you know, it took the loss of a child that, like that in order to see that, to help him to recognize. But you know, do you do you think God gonna hold him responsible? I mean, I mean, he made a mistake. So that kind of thing. So 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 you do do have those kind of you know situations you have to um, consider. But ultimately, then I'm gonna talk about hell um, and how 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 you can go to hell. Okay? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> See how far we get without me losing my voice. Yes, happens mm -hmm. lately. So we've been trying really hard not to do that. Um, now uh, I know the advertisement had uh, Memento Mori, which is remember your death. And we say that um, for a couple of reasons. Is because we always have to remember that this is not our final uh, place. This is our only temporary journey place, and we're, we're destined to something greater and something eternal. So that's what my talk is basically going to talk about a little bit. We're going to talk, we're going to kind of break that up a little bit. Um, I am, I've been a third order Dominican, just so you know who I am. Um, I've been a third order Dominican since uh, 1997. And, uh, and I'm married, I have uh, three kids and, um, who are wonderful uh, functioning adults, so that's a lovely <laughs> thing. Um, we still pray for their faith because that's what we do as moms and dads. So, I mean, that's forever. So, um, uh, I also teach here at Blessed Sacrament and I taught in the public school system. I retired this year and I taught mathematics in high school. So that's just a little bit of who I am. Um, so the daily reminder of death isn't something macabre or depressing, but it's something hopeful um, and joyful, and that this veil of tears is not the end of our existence, it's not the goal. So even though um, death is something we have to deal with, John Paul II says it's the ultimate act of violence, the separation of the soul and the body, um, we, that will eventually be joined together again and um, with the grace of God. So that's a good thing. Um, so what does the church believe about death? That's what Father Luan gave me. <laughs> so um, first we're going to talk about why is there death at all, um, and then uh, how Jesus transforms death. And at the time of death, there is a particular judgment for us, and that we either have heaven, purgatory, or hell. And that's our three options. I mean, that's God's three options for us. So that's kind of what we're going to cover tonight, hopefully fairly quickly. Why is there death at all? When we reject God, the source of life, death enters into the world. We knew um, if you're familiar with the story of Adam and Eve, which we all are, um, they believed that they couldn't trust God. They'd rather trust something else, and they didn't trust God. And so God promised that if they ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, that um, they would certainly die. And God is faithful to his word. And so um, they transgressed, now there's death. And so he didn't make death uh, as part of creation initially, but in death, um, God calls us to himself. And so um, it's really kind of interesting if we go all the way back to Genesis. Um, here they have obviously sinned. God knows that they sinned. And he goes searching for them. Like they're going to hide from him, you know? I mean, you've got to think of the situation. It's kind of funny in a way. And so they, like, God doesn't know where they are in creation. And so he goes and searches for them. And that's what he still does today. 
He searches for us. And he calls us to himself. And he wants us to be living with him eternally. That's what he made us for. That's what our goal is, eternity. And that's what he wants for us. So our hearts are restless until they rest in God. We don't know that. We are always looking for something to fill us up. Maybe this, maybe that. Maybe a new car, maybe a new house, maybe a new spouse, maybe, 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 right? Maybe there's something, but we really eventually have to turn to the fact that it's only God and where we're going to find that peace and we're going to rest in God. So, um, and God desires this. This is what he wanted. And so God loved us so much, okay, um, that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So he gave us a remedy. He told us that there was going to be a remedy in Genesis, back in Genesis, and he fulfills that in Jesus Christ by sending his son. By suffering our death, and that's what our punishment is, our punishment for sin is death, he transforms it into means of being in union with him. I mean, you got you got to say that's pretty ingenious. I mean, who thinks of those kinds of things but God? I mean, if we say to ourselves, you know, oh, is there really a God, and, you know, and maybe not, and is there, life and, and is there life after death, and really, and we say to ourselves, who could think of this? Who could actually say, I'm going to have creation, and I'm going to have a remedy for this, and I am going to restore eternal life to them, and I'm going to do that by having my son, who is eternal, who's the only one who can actually make reparation, because we can't, right? Thomas Aquinas says, right? Thomas Aquinas says this, and I love this example. Um, let's say uh, two little boys are playing, and um, two little boys, and the mother comes in, and they start fighting, and they separate them, and they're hurting each other, and they separate them, and, you know, they're in corners, right? Time out. Okay. And then when they start to grow up, one of these boys has not really gotten rid of his anger and he hits his mother. Not a good idea. And then he still is not in control of himself and he goes and hits a policeman. And now he's got, now he's got a bigger punishment, right? Now he's actually not in timeout anymore, but in timeout in prison. Okay? And so what's the difference? It's the same act. Right? Hitting a brother, hitting a mother, hitting a policeman, hitting a president. What's, this, what's the difference? The difference is that the authority that those people have, right? A mother has a certain authority, different than a brother. A policeman, if he hits a policeman, if he hits the president, right? Those are all different levels of authority. If we think about harming God by sin, by disobeying him, how in the world do we make up for that? Because he's so eternal. He's so omnipotent. He's so perfect. How do we make up atonement for that? And only God himself makes up that atonement through Jesus Christ. So he is God-man. He is offering himself as man to take the punishment as God. Wow. I mean, who thinks of those things but God? So his resurrection gives us hope that we will share his life. Um, this is a First Peter, praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth again into living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and, and an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. First Peter. And so when we say that we belong to the body of Christ, the body of Christ is resurrected, and we're going to go up there with him if we choose. And that's our, still our choice. Okay? That's still our choice. Okay, so death puts an end to this earthly life. I think we figured that one out, right? I think we're all good on that. And it is the thing of encounter with Jesus. Okay? So many people, there's after death experiences, they people see a light, and they, well, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light, right? He is the light. And, um, and so the final destiny of the soul is the evaluation of life lived on earth. Jesus taught us. I mean, he didn't hide how we were going to be judged. He said, um, 
Each one of us should be able to account to God. In Matthew 25, he says, what you did for the least of my brothers, you did for me. And so therefore, he separates you know, the sheep and the goats. And he says, when you did it for my, when do we see you, Lord? When we saw you in the poor, when we saw you hungry, when we saw you weak, when we saw you and we helped you. That's when, Jesus says. And so we have opportunities here on earth to live a life. And so um, we get to choose, then God chooses for us, not chooses for us, but says, okay, we have an immediate entrance into heaven. You did everything I asked you to do. You were perfect in what you did. You asked for forgiveness, and you are perfect, and you come into heaven. And then, not quite there. You're almost there. You love God. You try to serve him in this world. But there's lots of unrepentant sin. There's lots of things that we may not even realize were sins, that we never even um, uh, repented of. And so um, that goes through what we're going to call perfect purification. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. And then there's something that is everlasting damnation. And we'll talk about what hell is about. What is heaven? Well, we see him as he is, face to face. That's 1 John and, and 1 Corinthians. Um, the mystery of the blessed communion with God and all who are in Christ is beyond all understanding and description. Paul talks about this, you know, and eye has not seen, ear has not heard, for, um, nor the heart of man can be conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. He has compared this to a wedding feast. He's compared to Jesus serving us in heaven. He compares this to, um, uh, there are many rooms that I will go and prepare for you. He, there's lots of different things and images that God gives us because he knows that we learn through our senses and what we see and what we hear and what we feel. And so he, he gives us things to hold on to. But what we can conceive of is incredible because God is incredible. Okay? So um, I, one, of, one of my students said, I had shown them something about a picture of heaven. They go, is that what heaven's like? That's really beautiful. I just thought we were going to sit on clouds. You know? And, that's, and that's, that, that's what a child thinks. And we're children. Okay? We don't understand. We don't understand what this heaven is all about. We don't get it. And so... Because it's about God, and it's something we haven't totally seen, right? And while we are, we are limited to what we can see, what we can touch, what we can feel, what we can hear, that's our limited world. But that's not where God is limited to, okay? So heaven is a wonderful thing. St. John of the Cross talks about a ray when, we, when he says, when we go before God, we will see the light. Well, we'll see. We'll be in a room, basically, he says, um, there's a ray of love shining through a window into a dark room. You don't see the light, but you see the dust particles. Do you ever see that? You know, you see the light coming through, you see the dust particles, that the shines, and, and those are the defects in the soul. We have pure light that emanates, but when, we're, when God illuminates who we are, we really see what we are and who we are. Okay? And as the soul begins to see them and mourn, what they've done tremendously. And they see all the opportunities in this world to love of God, the opportunities to please Him, to help others, so the soul begins to regret them, and begins to mourn them, and begins to atone for them. The purifying effect of God's love is to burn those things away precisely so that they disappear, and one is transformed completely into God's love. Wow. Who doesn't want that? And in fact, you know, <clears throat> knowing who I am, you know, and I still have these little little things of anger, little things of impatience, I don't want me in heaven that way. I don't want other people in heaven that way either. Do you? Would that be heaven? No. And so God then not only, not only does he he gives us this incredible time after death to totally purify all the hurt, all the pain, clean it up, 
you know, get rid of it, you know. Um, one, of, one of my teachers used to say, you know, having, you know, you know, we have a breezeway where we take off our shoes and clean off, you know, get all the all the, the dirt and the grime from the snow and everything, and and you know, God has a breezeway into heaven, and it's called purgatory. Okay, there's we are promised to go into per, into heaven. Uh, it's not like we're separated forever. It's just the cleanup period, which is a wonderful, wonderful grace, a wonderful thing. Um, when we review our, our life in Christ, we clearly see all of our unrepentant sins. We also see the hurt we caused others, and we regret what we've done. And it creates in us a holy sorrow. And we are assured of eternal salvation, but we're still imperfect. Now, um, you know, uh, eventually, you know, um, this is a particular judgment, but um, one, of the, one of the things which is really kind of amazing, since God sees everything and he's currently present now, he sees it all, he also knows the consequences of what we did to the nth generation. You know, our consequences don't end with our lives. You know, we pass on genetically problems like I left my eyes from my mother, you know, they're imperfect, okay? But we pass on things to our children and to the people that we meet and the people that we encounter, even the people that we see driving down really crazy on the road. All those people are somehow we're still connected in the body of Christ. We're all together and we all also hurt each other in the body of Christ. And sometimes we don't even realize we've hurt somebody. We say something probably incidental and you know and they're you know they can carry that on for years. Something we didn't even mean to say. Okay. So purgatory is the purification of the self and letting go of our false self. God created us to be these incredible things. And we have all these pains and problems and things that keep us from being truly who we are called to be. And so we get rid of all those things. And letting go of whatever keeps us from fully accepting God's loving and grace. That's what purgatory is about. So three points of purgatory. Purification after death exists. Um, the act of purification involves suffering, and purification can be eased by the prayers and good works and sacrifices of the living. That's basically what purgatory is all about, those three things. Now, <clears throat> um, purification after death exists. In the Old Testament, by the way, even in Zechariah, um, we hear him give this prophecy about uh, God um, judging different things, and he has, and I will lead a third of them through fire, and I will burn them just as silver is burned, and I will say, you are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. So he's not dismissing them. He's not saying you're in hell, but he's going to lead them through a particular fire. In Maccabees, therefore, Judas Maccabee made atonement for the dead that they might be delivered from their sins. Okay? So in the New Testament, we hear each one's work will be made manifest, and the fire will test each one's work as to what kind it is. If anyone's work is burned, ah, sorry, he will suffer its loss, but he himself will, stand, will be saved, but only as through fire. Now, what does this mean, and what is the fire of purgatory? Okay. And so... Um, the act of purification involves suffering. So that one thing it exists, and what does suffering in purgatory mean? It's caused when we are separated from the ones we love. Anybody who has kids, or a family, or a mom that they dearly love, or a child, and when even when they just go to school, isn't it kind of like, oh my gosh, they're going to school today? They're out of my control. What's going to happen to them? You know, um, there's. Anytime we're physically separated from the people that we love, we suffer. That's just, that's just the way it is. I mean, I'm sure you've all kind of experienced that. And so souls long to be united with God. Once they meet God in judgment and see who he is, they want to be with him. They really want to be united to God. 
but they can't. And as a result, there's a certain type of pain there, a pain of longing for God. Okay? The more we long for God, the more these, the, and the more these things that kept us from God in this life are, that are not being part of God begin to be burned away. And precisely so that the longing for God might be realized completely. So, um, purgatory does not only begin at death, but it's viewed as a progressive state of being here. You know, here, he, when you have an argument with your spouse, you know, and you say, yes, I forgive you, thank you very much, but it's really kind of nice. You know, that's not really enough. They bring you candy, or they bring you, or little kids, right? They bring you a little card, I'm so sorry, Mom, you know? And those are, um, those are the types of things that um, we do as penances here on earth. That's, that's the type of things we're also going to be continuing to doing in, 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 in heaven, in purgatory. Because that act of penance, we even learn here. And making up for things, you know? Even though, you know, we hand out a kid, breaks a window, right? He breaks the window, or the neighbor's window, and the neighbor forgives them, somebody's got to pay for the window. Even here on earth, we have penances we make up for. St. Teresa of Lizzo, I, I mean, I love her, you know, the little flower. Everybody loves her because she's, you know, she said when she went into the convent, she didn't know what her apostolate was. Like, what is my thing? What is my thing? And she started to read the scriptures. You know, and she read, you know, this is the one, you know, you could be a prophet, you could be a this, you could be a that. She goes, what am I supposed to be? And so she says, and she read the next chapter, 13. But I can show you a more excellent way. Love. Love. And she goes, that's my apostolate. I'm going to love. I can do every little act with tremendous love. And she says, says purgatory is totally avoidable. All you have to do, if a person will totally surrender to God in all things during this earthly life, with a childlike trust, then God would purify them and prepare them to go to heaven immediately after death. All we have to do is surrender everything to God. Got that down? <laughs> Everybody there? Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> she went straight to heaven. Okay. I don't think I'm getting there, but we'll see. <laughs> I'm praying to God. So, um, the third thing, purgatory, we can help in their transition. Okay, the catacombs have had various inscriptions for praying for the dead. Ever since there has been burial, okay, in the Catholic Church, um, there has been prayers for the dead in the Catholic Church. As early as 70 AD, there are masses being said in the catacombs for the dead. There's inscriptions. Go down there, read them. It's nice and cold, and it's a wonderful place. If you're in Rome, please never go to Rome in August. It's too hot. But if you are... Or the catacombs <laughs> because they're nice and cool, and because there's no air conditioning in Rome, and um, but uh, you can see inscriptions for the dead. Okay, as the communion of saints, because we are the communion of saints, we can help those in purgatory through our prayers, sacrifices, works of penance, almsgiving, indulgences, and we make eternal friendships with those souls in purgatory. Okay. We pray for them. We may not even know who they are. We see, you know, some, sometimes you get a little nudge. I don't know if you get a little nudge. I get these little nudges. My husband really gets these nudges. And, you know, he'll say, you know, I think such and such needs prayers. You know, he, you know, he was our best man, and he died, you know, last January. But, you know, I'm just feeling a kind of restlessness in my soul for him. And so he'll have, he'll be, he'll be saying rosaries and prayers, and he has, you know, masses said for him. And, and until he feels somehow that uh, it's no longer a burden that he's carrying. Um, St. John Chrysogon says, let us help them, this is the dead. For if Job's sons, and this is Job did this, by the way, if Job's sons were purified by their father's sacrifice, why would we doubt that our offerings for the dead bring them a source of consolation? So, you know, if from the very early, all the church fathers, St. Anselm, St. Uh, Origen, Tertullian, 
um, St. Ambrose especially, St. John Christendom, they all talked about praying for the dead. Okay? For some reason, I think it's kind of been dropped off the thing. Now, there's been misconceptions about purgatory. Okay? So I'm going to cover those since we have a little time. Do you mind? Okay. <coughs> the only dogma or teaching the church has on this about the fire is that purgatory involves some types of suffering. It doesn't define, it doesn't say it's this, it's that, it's this kind of suffering. It doesn't really define it. It doesn't say what that, what that suffering looks like. Thomas Aquinas says, the chief purpose of purgatory is to cleanse us from the remains of sin, and consequently the pain of fire is only ascribed to purgatory. The only reason why we use the term fire is because fire cleanses and consumes. Okay, so we understand, our, our conscious mind understands what fire does. Okay? The focus of purgatory is purification, not fire. This is out of the Catechism, by the way. Consequently, one's understanding needs not be limited exclusively to a fire image. Instead, church fathers say that the painful fires of purgatory are entirely different from those in hell emphasizing purgatory's transitionary nature and assuring the soul's salvation. So this is not, um, remember, purgatory is a temporary place, okay, just temporary. And so therefore, it's not what we necessarily think of souls physically burning um, in hell, okay. That's not what a purgatory is all about. Now, Pope Benedict, um, he wrote one on hope. Okay. Many theologians think of this fire now, not in terms of punishment, but in terms of God and God's love. The traditional image of the heart of Jesus is a heart on fire with love. And, and we, with our sins, encounter and we, with our sins and residue, our baggage, the consequences of our sins. When we encounter God at the end of our lives, we encounter a God who, in the letter to the Hebrews, at the end of chapter 12, said, God is a consuming fire. Also, the fire of purgatory is best seen as God's love, which purifies us, fully aware that they are beloved of God, the holy souls of purgatory, long for the most intimate unification with him. Their pain is the pain of temporal, tempor temporarily excluded from the beatific, beatific vision. Thus, today's church understands this as the pain of separation. Okay? So, um, Bill Benedict, I, I, I just read his stuff because he's just really quite amazing. But um, I think he, he kind of really captured this. When we look at Jesus and the image of love that we have, think of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes down as wind, but also as tongues of fire, right? And in, um, in the scriptures, I'll think about it in just a second, says, you know, enkindle in, enkindle in us the fire of your love. I mean, send forth your spirit. This is in the Psalms. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Enkindle in us. Paul talks about, do not let this fire go out. We should be on fire with God's love. And if we're on fire with God's love now, well, that all makes it all the better, all the easier getting through purgatory. Because we'll understand that fire and respond to that fire as a positive thing. The other part of misconception about purgatory is time. Okay? As clearly we cannot calculate the duration of this transforming, transforming burning in terms of the chronological measurements of this world. You know, God doesn't go by our clock, right? We say, we have, we know that one hour to God, you know, one day is a blink of the eye, or, you know, a thousand years is a blink of the eye to God. He's not, he's not into time. He's not bound by time. We are, he's outside of time. So purgatory time-wise, how long, you know, Father Luan talks about, you know, somebody who was in 1908 
uh, Padre Pio was still alive in, you know, 1968 still, could have been 60 years of our time in purgatory. But we can't think that, how long should I pray? How long should I pray? How, you know, it's interesting, the Jewish tradition has that they pray the Kaddish um, for one whole year, which is a uh, prayer for the dead, for one whole year after somebody dies. Um, as a Dominican order, we do Psalm 130, the De Profundis, and we are an order that prays a lot for the dead. We have days that we set aside specially to pray for the dead, especially in November. So, um, so who, who goes to hell? I mean, if God's this burning love, and who goes to hell? Well, hell is freely chosen by us. Well, not me, so not me, but, but God predestines no one to go to hell. That's not like, you know, God, there are certain, you know, um, Christian sects even that says God predestined them to go to hell. No, he doesn't. That's not what he does. Um, having given us freedom, God allows us to ultimately direct life with him. You know, we get to choose. Do you want to love or not love? Do you want to be loved or not be loved? That's your choice. Refusal to love God and neighbor leads to hell. And hell is unending. There's no repentance after death. That's it. Failure to love others is a failure to love God and leads to damnation. Hell is everlasting. Matthew 25. Okay. All right. Hell is a separation from communion with God and the blessed. Separation from God is the greatest punishment of hell. The person in hell hates God and everyone else. I just can't imagine. I mean, is that really? No. I just can't even imagine. Hell is the place for the unrepentant sinner. All evildoers will be thrown into the fiery furnace. I think that that's really going to be terrible. And the damned, the damned suffer exclusion from the presence of the Lord. Can you imagine no, no hope of love? No hope of being loved or loved. Just pain and misery and hate. The absence of God. Okay, recap. Why is there death at all? Well, because sin separates us from God. And the ultimate separation in death um, is the ultimate separation from God, of course, is hell. But God separates us, sin separates us from God, and the wages, and that's the scripture, the wages of sin is death. That's what it is. And it was a blessing. To th now think about death. Death is actually, I mean, I always, I mean, I think this is how I think, but then again, that's me. It's such a blessing that God gave us death. It was his goodness that gave us death. And why do I say that? Can you imagine living eternally here? <laughs> Is this an eternity you want to live? Really? No. So he gave us death, knowing that he had a remedy for it. And that was Jesus Christ. What a plan, right? What a plan. Okay, so Jesus transforms death. His death on the cross opens to us eternal life. At the time of death, there is a particular judgment. Heaven, for those who are purified from all sin. Purgatory, for those who are being purified from all sin. And assured of heaven. Remember that. We can assist them in this period of transition. Hell, those who will, who will to exist for all eternity in separation from God. I think that's all I've got. Questions? I finished it in a decent amount of time. Now let me scare the heck out of you. Do you have questions? Yes, of course. So the early church prayed for the dead. Yes. Why? And if and if they did, which we know they did, why don't Protestants pray for the dead? Ah. Well, can you repeat the question for the camera? Uh, sure. Okay, for the camera. Daniel, <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, we would repeat the question for the camera. Yes, I'm getting there. Sure. Okay. Uh, the question was, if we prayed for the dead, which we did, why don't Protestants pray for their dead? Well, that goes back to Luther, Martin Luther, 
who condemned the whole concept of purgatory, and he condemned the fact, and he was kind of inspired by this things in scripture they don't follow either. But they think, you know, I'm not going to Well, we do have uh, people who are former Lutherans here, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll attempt to, uh, to answer the question. But basically for Martin Luther, uh, a very key important concept for Lutherans of, of Martin Luther is uh, sola, sola, fide, sola fide. I mean, you are saved, you are, you are justified by faith alone. And he, that's the way he interpreted Augustine, he interpreted Roman, the letter to Roman. But basically that means, because you are said by faith alone, that we works are uh, useless. For us Catholics, we believe in merits. So, what does it merit mean? You go to church, you pray, you merit. You merit something, it's, 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 you earn something. Merit in any way, it's earned in some way earned. Um, Luther said, no, there's nothing you can do. You are corrupted people, you are corrupted human beings, there's nothing good you can do. Um, your grace, your saving come from God alone. Um, whereas for Catholic, yes, you are saved by God's grace, but that grace enter you, and, and you want to use that grace in order to cooperate, in order to do good works. And so good works count, whether it's uh, a fasting, uh, praying, uh, giving money to the poor, uh, that kind of thing. Those are good works that merit God's grace or merit uh, yeah. that can help you in a way. Yeah. They are, you know, Luther also kind of understood justification in that uh, um, we're covered. We're covered by God, okay? And so, but we believe that God transforms us, okay, by grace, by grace. Paul talks about that. That we are being transformed grace by grace. And we are being transformed into the image and likeness of God. And we're being transformed. And that's what Jesus did in the transfiguration. And that's what we are aiming at. And so we exercise these things in order to be closer and closer united to Jesus. In imitation of him. Okay. Yes. In your reading of the catechism, do you have any comments about universal salvation? Universal salvation? Right. Does the church have an opinion on whether there will be universal salvation and that it can't happen? So that is a topic of uh, uh, debate. <clears throat> uh, another way to ask the question is, uh, are there more people go to heaven or are there more people go to hell? Um, and the church never really come down, uh, that never really come down onto uh, uh, a, 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 a decisive position. I may be wrong, but never the church never really not come out on a decided. Yeah, I'll give you a second, okay? Maybe um, decided position is that. So um, universal salvation means that. I you mean you mean that in the end everybody gonna be saved? At the end no, of there's time, no, there's no hell. At the end of time, everyone will end up in hell. Right. So that's that position in the early church you had, I think it was an origin, I think one of, one of the person, one of the, one of the uh, early theologians, he said, God, power, God is so powerful, God's love is so incredible that in the end, um, there will be, that everybody going to be saved, there will be no hell. So hell, hell may exist for a little time, for a time, but in the end, at the universal judgment, um, hell, there, there will be no hell. The church n never acknowledged that, but the, the, the other position is because in the in scripture, in Bible, so many times it's mentioned about the eternal damnation, eternal fire, so, so, so that's, that's kind of thing. But I, I don't think the church ever come down uh, definitely, definitely about whether there is universal salvation. Why don't we go for her and then we'll go no. to her. Oh, yeah. Can I just change the battery real quick? Sure. Go ahead. Yes, you can. You can answer. Yeah. Well, I, I just didn't know what universal salvation was, and you just you did, oh, okay. you okay. Okay. defined it. Yeah. I was going to say the Catechism says the Church prays and hope that all are saved. Yeah, yeah. But, so, but, yeah, that's well, but okay, okay. So, so, so yeah, but call, that's but there's an interpretation of that oh, as well. Okay. No, no, no. Let, let me let me read it from the quote from the, the Catechism. Okay, the Church prays that no one should be lost, and then here's the quote: Lord. Uh, let me never be parted from you. That's the prayer of the church. Lord, never be never parted from you. If it is true that no one can save himself, it is also true that God desires all men to be saved. 1 Timothy uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 4. And that for him, all things are possible. So, I mean, 
do you want to decide for God that you know, the the rule of thumb, the 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 same the, the rule of thumb for the church uh, for the, uh, theologian, the rule of thumb is the church knows who go to heaven, but church the church doesn't know who go to hell. Right. What does that mean? The church know they the saints are in heaven, Mary is in heaven, uh, St. Thomas, St. Uh, St. Dominic, St. Francis. When the church said they are saints, the church basically say, we know for sure they are in heaven. They just never really say, oh, Hitler is in hell, or uh, you know, Stalin, or that, that kind of thing. Because the church doesn't, doesn't have, the, I mean, doesn't have the, uh, the, the right to declare that kind of thing. Um, so, but then again, you know, no, you have a merciful God on one hand, you also have a just God. If somebody who does so many terrible things, it's only seem justice that sh they should, or, or and they don't want, they don't like God, they don't want to be with God, also seem justice. But anyway, so that's kind yeah, of, I mean, it yeah. just never does, definitely. Right, so. and then also, you know, God respects our free will. Yes. So um, to say that he's going to take everybody to heaven whether they want to go or not just doesn't <laughs> seem like God to me, but, you know, that's... That that seems contrary to free will. Yes. Yes. But that so the more the more interesting question is, uh, and you can look up on on uh, online about the debate. Uh, Bishop uh, Robert Barron also uh, have a, 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 a session on that. The question is, uh, are are there more people in hell or are there more people in heaven? Um, Thomas Aquinas seem to suggest that there are more people uh, in hell than heaven, because by justice. We, are, we, we deserve condemnation. Yes. Um, Jesus in the in the Bible he says, um, choose the narrow way because the wide way is is, is broad, but 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 it leads to perdition of many. And then he also said, many are called, but only few are chosen. So if you want to use those quotes, then you can say, wow, chances are, <laughs> look look to your left or to your right, the majority of us <laughs> don't know where you know what. Um, but then Thomas Aquinas also. Also, he, 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 he also opened the possibility of uh, 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 that, 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 that uh, God's mercy um, overcome so that in that way the majority would go to heaven instead of hell. And, and so uh, Bishop Robert Barron, he said that we should have some sort of hope. The hope is the majority, the large, the, the, uh, the, the majority will go to heaven instead of hell, that kind of thing. And that goes back to the church praise and hope that all are saved. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And it's our hope. Any comments or other questions? Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. What happens to people who are not Catholic, who don't believe in Christ? Okay, so uh, Vatican II, documents of Vatican II clearly state that the normal way for us to know and serve God in this life is through the church. He is not limited to his church. And his ways are not our ways. And he has opportunities for people because he desires all to be saved. And if no one has heard of Christ or nobody has, you know, been introduced to Christ or have never heard of such a thing, then um, God is not going to certainly condemn them because he gives them opportunities to deal with that. And so his ways are, not, are beyond our ways. He's not limited to his church. So what happens to a child who uh, dies in childbirth or through a miscarriage? Before baptism. Yeah, that's what he yeah. yes. Well, um, John, John Paul II came out with his encyclical uh, um, stating that um, uh, they um, are in heaven, they're with God, okay? So um, that's been amended, that that hope is in God, but um, he firmly believes that they go to, straight to heaven. I trust him. <laughs> I trust him. Uh, one of my favorites. Yes? Well, if um, we can pray for the people in purgatory, of course we can pray for the people in heaven. What about prayers for the people in hell? Do they ever, is there ever mercy that they can move okay. to purgatory? Or? So the, this, the question is, the question is, if we can pray for people in heaven, we have the communion of saints of heaven, the communion of saints with people in purgatory, do we have a communion of saints with people in hell? 
that's a crazy question. Mm -hmm. And can they move out of hell? Um, the scripture indicates that the story of Lazarus, you know, um, where the man, um, Lazarus, is outside this rich man's door, and he's trying to, not even eating the crumbs from the dogs, and he suffers, and he is in the bosom of Abraham, and Lazarus is in hell, and he says, um, tell, tell um, Lazarus to bring me some water. And he says, she, and Abraham says, there is a chasm between us that cannot be breached. And then he says, well, send somebody, send, send Lazarus to my brothers to teach them. And the interesting response is, um, even someone being raised from the dead may not convince them. And so many people don't believe in the resurrection of Christ, you know, um, and don't want to believe in the resurrection of Christ. So, um, can we pray? The problem is we don't know if they're in hell or not. So it does make us, you know, so my suggestion is to pray for them <clears throat> because we are not, we cannot assume that they're in hell. And if we think they're in jeopardy, they might be in purgatory, then we certainly pray for them. So when, in the Apostles' Creed, when Jesus went down to hell, he went down to get the uh, souls to take them up to heaven because he's the new covenant. And until then, there had been no salvation. Okay, when, right? When Jesus... So when he went down to hell, on the third okay, day, there's, he there's, there's, from the, right? Do you want to take that one? Or do you want me to sure, I mean, the, uh, the Creed said that um, after Jesus died, he descended into hell. Okay. And then, the yeah, that's right. So, so yeah. So, um, <clears throat> the church father tend to uh, um, suggest that there are different levels of hells. That different levels of hell. Um, limbo, limbo is near the gate of hell, but not quite hell. And so, for um, uh, Thomas Aquinas would say something like, uh, "Good people like Moses, Isaiah, when they die, they didn't go to heaven because." Jesus didn't come down and redeem us yet, so heaven was closed, but they was in some sort of limbo. So limbo is, is, is a level above hell, and then there's, there's, there's those who die, and they're in the nether world, they in sort of in hell, they in hell in that sense. Um, and so in, in the bosom of, uh, uh, the, the expression is, in the bosom of Abraham, is bosom of Abraham for, for, for Aquinas would be like a limbo. Bosom of Abraham is a place, blessedness to quite, not quite heaven. When Jesus died, he he went to hell and he rescued the souls, uh, and then from there, from then, then he opened paradise for all those who have gone before him. So that's 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 my answer. Okay. Well, yeah. we are all a creation of God, and, and God leaves up to us as to what level we been, where, and when we are clear in our mind that we're ready to go somewhere else. We, we, when we die, we don't just stop thinking. We we're alive. We're experiencing everything in our own life and everything that around us may be. Uh, if we thought that uh, I need to be punished for something I did, well, then that creates purgatory or hell. And people will say, and that's a miserable mess, and there's nothing that can escape me. And they go to hell. <laughs> well, despairing of God's mercy. You know, Sister Faustina is a wonderful saint about this. Um, she says, we all go before God with empty hands. And we say, we rely on the mercy of God. Our faith in Jesus Christ should be so firm that <clears throat> we trust his mercy more than we trust ourselves. And so uh, we should not condemn ourselves to guess there's, there's, there's no hope. There is always hope because there's always the mercy of God. And that's what Sister Faustina, that's what Jesus wanted to portray through, the, through uh, Sister Faustina, that even though the most, she says, and he tells, even the most terrible sinner, that's the one that needs the mercy the most. That's who needs my mercy the most. That's what my death can accomplish, is that salvation of that soul. 
So we should never ever despair that what we do in this life is so terrible, it's unforgivable. Everything is forgivable before God. I mean, if, they, if he forgave people who killed God, we didn't do that necessarily, maybe, but we, we were just usually mean to people. I mean, anything, anything can be brought before God and, and be healed by his mercy. Everything. There isn't one thing that is not before God's, that's greater than God's mercy. To think our sin is bigger than God's mercy, thinks that, that we're bigger than Jesus. I don't think so. So that we bring to um, the question of hope. Um, <clears throat> and I, I would say that the devil, the, the, the reason why we don't pray for those in hell, because those, the, the, those in hell, they do not have hope. Um, the devil, he knows what who God is. Who knows, he, he knows who Jesus is. You remember in the Bible, there was a man who was possessed by a demon, and the demon said, I know who you are, Jesus Christ, I know who you are. So the devil, the demons, they know who Jesus is. But what is the difference between the, the devil and us is that we have hope in God, whereas the devil, those in hell, they have no hope. That means, what does it mean to have no hope? They say, there's no way God can, can forgive me that sin. There's no way uh, God can do that. There's no way that God can come down from heaven and allow people to spit on him and crucify and kill him. There's no way, there's no way of a, a, man, a, 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 a being can love another person like that. So the, 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 that's what it means by lose hope, is that they said, there's no way my sin can be forgiven. There's a story about um, the devil went to confession with Padre Pio. And um, uh, there was a man saw, saw a, a tall man, ugly man, awful, awful looking man, went to, the, to, went to confess with Padre Pio. And at the, and at the end, uh, uh, well, I'll t I don't know if I should tell you. I can tell you. Maybe the, the priest died, but I don't know how, how true the story is. But, uh, so the uh, priest said that, um, well, no, no, let's just stick with Padre Pio. And, uh, Padre, Pio. <laughs> and uh, uh, Padre Pio, and then the, the man said that, um, at the end, Padre Pio said, uh, 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 after he confessed his sin, the Padre said, I, God, uh, uh, I'm, I'm here to absorb you from your sins, and the man laughed. He laughed, he laughed, and then he disappeared. Because he didn't think that God can forgive him his sin. I have another similar story. Somebody told me when he was alive, now he's not dead, but he, but he basically said something similar to that. He, um, he looked for that person, never appeared, but, but anyway. Um, so, so, um, so it, that's, that's, I think that there's a reason why, you know, it's, it's a waste, I mean, it's, it's un un useful for us to pray for those in hell because they don't have hope. But that's also a reminder to you, to us, is that you nurture that sense of faith, hope, and charity in you. Because it can be, you know, when you're in dark time, you can lose hope. And, 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 and you, you know, you, know, you hold on to that hope. Um, Traditionally, there's a there's a there's a, 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 a it's not it's not a church position, but it's an unofficial position. A lot of people think that if you kill yourself, you go immediately to hell. You're gonna, you're gonna go to hell. You're gonna go straight to hell if you kill yourself. You commit suicide because suicide is a, is a, an act of of, of uh, despair, no hope. And the church says no, 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 no. Uh, the church says suicide is bad. Killing yourself is bad. Don't do it. But at the same time, they just said there are people, they are under uh, psychological distress, they are under a lot of things, and, and so the church can only pray for them. They just pray for those who take their own life. We, we shouldn't assume automatically that those go to hell, right? But again, the idea is that don't lose hope, because when you lose hope, that's when, that's when, that's when the, the problem a um, couple of things that have come to mind is that um, to respond to those, I want to touch on that, but somebody asked about um, what about people who are not Catholic, and it just stuck out to me the Good Shepherd, parable of the Good Shepherd, and at the end saying there will be other, you know, sheepfolds, these I must also lead, you know, that gives a lot of hope to other people who are not in the Catholic faith, but also with um, the the time, you know, and with the people who commit suicide, God is completely outside of time. You know, time, like you said, it's not, it's not, we don't know what it is, but it, you know, minute could be 
in a century, uh, you know, whatever, thousands of years for him. So if someone does, you know, commit suicide, we don't know if God takes those last moments for that person and it sends it long enough, you know. And so, I mean, the hope in that, that they, you know, and we don't know. So why do we assume we should never assume it? And the hope in that, you know. Okay, you, you talked on two different things. Yeah. <laughs> um, one was about this, our separated brothers and sisters mm -hmm. in Christ. Um, but you have to remember, okay, that our baptism is yeah. baptism into the death of Christ. Our baptism, okay, we, we die with Christ in baptism and we rise with Christ. When we say remember our death, one of the things we should remember is our baptism. Mm -hmm. And we have that in common with other Christians. And they're baptized into that same death, and they will rise with Christ yeah. in that. Okay? Yeah. So that's one thing. The second thing about, you're right, about suicides, in that there is time between like, jumping off a bridge from then to hitting the ground. I mean, there is time that is an eternity, in a way, for, between for God to do that. And there's plenty of um, stories... One um, about a priest who um, was a very holy priest but suffered from terrible, terrible, terrible depression. Terrible depression. And um, after Mass, um, he would uh, go before the Blessed Sacrament and pray that this would be lifted from him. And he would be in such prayer that some of his parishioners, who loved him dearly, um, almost had to get him pick him up bodily to get him back into the rectory sometimes. Mm -hmm. Eventually, the, pre the priest um, went into the basement and committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And a priest who had been in that same church three years later, who had known him, but oh, about ten, I'm sorry, had known him before he had committed suicide, but he's been in that, so three other pastors had been in that church since then, so it was about 10 years later. And he gets this feeling to pray for this priest. Okay? And the parishioners were devastated, just totally devastated. And they had put rose bushes all the way around the church in memory of this priest. And so he started praying for this priest. And um, he had actually had a vision of this priest. And he said, listen, this is my house now. You're not allowed in it, okay? But I will pray for you every day. And he had a ministry of praying for people. He had a, a book that he kept, and he brought it to the altar every day. And he said, I am going to put this on my bookmarker so every day when I say my Mass, I'm praying for this priest. And he continued that until a little girl and her mom were there, and uh, he, actually it was his daughter and his granddaughter. He, he was an Episcopal priest who came into the Catholic Church. Mm. And so he's an Episcopal priest, but he had been married. So um, they were out there. They loved to watch the birds in the bird feeder and the bird bath and stuff. And the little girl said, Mom, look at that strange man. And she <coughs> said, there. She goes, right over there. Can't you see him? And he goes, do you think he's... A nice man or a bad man? Because she didn't see anything. And she goes, oh, he's a lovely man. He's a sweet man. And so, and she said, um, really, what does he look like? And she described, well, he's in black, and he's holding this black book, but he has no mouth. And she goes, really? She goes, that's very, very interesting. And she goes, now, Mom, look it. And he's just, he's above the church. And he's rising. And then she couldn't see him anymore. She immediately takes him to her father. Dad, we need to talk. <laughs> and she said, and he goes, really? And he goes, tell me about this man. And of course, the black book was the book that he brought to Mass every day that he was praying for. And the man had committed suicide by a gun in the mouth. Mm -hmm. And so he wanted him to know that that's, he could stop praying. Oh, wow. That's a true story. Sorry. So, and, and so, um, I think that gives hope for people. So we'll, we'll end with a, uh, a passage from the Catechism, but um, <clears throat> I just want to pick back on that. Uh, 
We can go on for a while, but you know. <laughs> we can go on for a while. Well, let people go, but if you want to stay around and talk some more. But um, you, do, you do have, you know, a story about haunted places, you know. People go to a house, they hear strange noise, they have uh, uh, supernatural uh, events or supernatural events going on. Uh, a, uh, one time in, uh, we, ha we had a, a, a meeting of uh, the priest. Uh, they brought in a, an expert in exorcism, a priest who studied in Rome on exorcism, and he said, yeah, those kind of things, there are different, different kind of demonic activities, and one thing is taxation, or sometimes it could be a soul uh, come back uh, to ask you for your prayer, so he, make noise, he or she make noises or so do something for it. So the priest said, what you do is you want to, when you think of that, you, you come to that place and you offer a mass. It could be somebody got murdered, got killed in that house. Uh, it could be uh, some tra tragedy happened in that house, and and so uh, God allowed those souls to come back and ask for your prayer. And you go there and you bless the house and you offer a mass for those souls. And so he, that, that's, that's, that's come from uh, an exorcist uh, who studied exorcism. By the way, um, I'll, I'll end with a passage from um, the Catechism. Huh? The church encourages us to prepare ourselves for the hour of our death. In, in the ancient litany of the saints, for instance, uh, the church has us pray from everlasting death, Lord, deliver us, we pray. To ask the mother of God to intercede for us at the hour of our death in the Hail Mary, and to entrust ourselves to Saint Joseph, the patron saint, the patron of a happy death. And here's a quote. Every action of yours, every thought, should be those of one who expects to die before the day is out. That should uh, have no great terrors for you if you have a quiet conscience. Then why not keep clear of sin instead of running away from death? If you are fit to face death today, it's very unlikely that you will be tomorrow. And then there's also a quote from Francis. St. Francis, instead of being afraid of death, this is what he said. Praise are you, my Lord, for my sister bodily death. Death is now, Francis called death a sister, just like he called the son, my brother. He called death a sister. Uh, from whom no living man can escape. Woe on those who will die in mortal sin. Blessed are they who will be found in your most holy will, for the second death will not harm them. So we end with a Hail Mary. Hail Amen. Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among men, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Help yourself to candies, cookies, drink, please. Help yourself. Thank you.